Let's start with Love the it. Thunder. Yeah. My, my beginning question to you, because I think this team is fucking awesome. My beginning question to you, do you think youth or experience matters in the playoffs? I think it will matter um, to a certain degree. I mean, and they have very little experience. So you just got a handful of games, I think, in the playoffs for Shea. You got, I think, a handful for Dort. For Dort, right? yep. And I think Isaiah Joe's got a few games under his belt. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> so here's why I think, here's why I think it can matter. If you haven't been in those situations in the playoffs where what's different is the weight of a certain moment or the weight of a game and what that means in the overall picture with getting out of that series. Like in the regular season, you're not going to feel that weight. You know, you, you certainly can feel if you're not playing well at the time, you'll feel pressure at the end of a particular game, right? At certain moments. Okay. You win or lose, you get on the charter, you get onto the next city, you go to the next game. And that's all that carried was one game. That's all that carried. Whatever happened in that pressure moment, it's not the case in the playoffs, right? These things are cumulative as the series goes, and there are pivotal points within series that can turn them. They're, they're series defining moments. I do think it helps to have some experience navigating those kinds of situations collectively. I do. One thing that they have going for them, they have a a style of play offensively and a lead player that I don't think is going to be phased too much by anything that he's going to see in Shea Gilgis yeah. Alexander, right? And their style of play, the continuity they have together, um, th that's 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 something that they can certainly hang their hat on. But look, to say that it just doesn't matter at all to never be in that two-two situation, fourth quarter of a game five, you know, one possession game, three minutes to go. To navigate that and, and the weight that you're going to feel of what that could mean and the impact of winning or losing that series, I, I do think it matters. I don't think it's something that I would dismiss a team and say you got no shot to make that run, you know, just because of that. But I also don't think you can say, oh, no, it doesn't matter whatsoever with a team this young that collectively has this little playoff experience. You know, the the thing with uh, the thing with Shea is he does have a little bit of playoff experience. He doesn't have. Uh, the playoff experience of being the guy. Mm -hmm. And I said this a few weeks ago, I am so fascinated and intrigued by how he is going to play in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the key developments to his offensive game has been the development of the counter. This motherfucker has a counter for everything mm -hmm. now. And we talk all the time about players with no holes in their game. I, I don't think Shea has a hole in his game, right? He's hitting threes now at r roughly 38%. Uh, his off-the-dribble game mid-range, his drives, he creates free throws. Limited, but he's been an elite post-up player when he has gotten those opportunities uh, against really anyone, not just mismatches. So watching him in real time as the guy and him figuring out the counters and the reads, that's going to be one of the most fascinating things to me about the playoffs. Clippers recently, Paul George said, right now we don't have an identity, which I don't really have a problem with because I think within a season that happens all the time with teams. Yeah, you, I agree. You find an identity, you lose an identity, yeah. you refine your identity, and your identity can shift four or five times in a season. This is who we are. This is what we're playing. This is what's working. Uh, the... The, the thing about the regular season is you're playing all these different teams. I think that's part of the reason your identity can shift so much. You're playing the same team over and over in the playoffs. When I look at the Oklahoma City Thunder, they have an identity to what they do offensively. And it starts with driving the basketball. Right. They are number one by far in terms of drives per game. Not only that, they're excellent at driving the ball. It's not just the volume of the drives. They're excellent at driving the ball. Number three in terms of field goal percentage on drives. Number one in terms of free throw attempts on drives. Number eight in points in the paint. It starts with that. On top of that, they're the number one team at three-point percentage. Dude, I was looking this up today. Outside of Giddy, this is their rotation, right? Jalen Williams, 45%. Dort, 41%. Chet, 39%. Shea, a little over 37%. Isaiah Joe, 41%. Kaysen Wallace, 42%. Uh, Aaron Wiggins, 48%. Kenrich, Kenrich Williams is in the 30, high 30s. 
Uh, Jalen Williams, the center from Arkansas, is al- almost 37%. Like, outside of Giddy, the they have link. shooting, yeah. Yeah. and they have drives, and they have spacing. Their drive and kick game is so fucking good. It's so good. So, Shea against a loaded defense, we've got answers to that. That's what it feels like to me. When I see Shea Gilgis Alexander, to me, what differentiates him from every other star scorer in the league is he operates in an area of the floor that no one else operates in all the time. He controls from edge of the lane to edge of the lane. If you were to draw a line straight up the edge of the lane all the way to half court, it's unbelievable the extent to which he's able to manipulate the basketball within that parameter. But no matter what, no matter what the defense does to him, no matter where he's shielded, no matter where he's sent, no matter where the traffic comes from, to your point about the counters, because of his ability to manipulate the basketball and get back centered and then stop at any time with probably the quickest mid-range pull-up in that area of the floor in the league. And and this just kind of hit me over watching him probably over the last 10, 15 games. I started watching this guy, and I'm like, it's really crazy. If you think about the other like top 15, 20 scores in the league, like they're all over the place. They'll be on the wing. They'll be in the post some, backing guys down, right? Sometimes they'll get in the corner and a ball screen out of the corner. Shea Gilgis Alexander stays in the middle of the floor like the entire time. And the pressure that that puts on defenses to try to figure out a way to like scheme for him where he doesn't have a great ability to, to get the ball out and there's great spacing now where guys can make a simple play and get a good shot. That to me is what separates him from every other elite offensive player in the league. He controls an area of the floor that makes it really difficult to scheme, to take the ball out of his hands, to blitz him, to whatever it may be, because it's you. when you run someone to that area of the floor, you're so exposed for a quick, easy three-point shot. And that is, to me, the, the greatness of Shea Gilgis Alexander. I've just never seen an offensive player be that comfortable in a crowded area of the floor in the paint. And you, you never really get to force him into an area that he's not comfortable. That is why I think they're so special offensively. And I also think, JJ, they're selective about their threes. They're, yes. they're, they're yeah, the yeah, highest yeah, three-point yeah. shooting team in the league. They don't take a ton. They're not a high, yeah, yeah. They're, they're in the low to mid-30s yeah, yeah. most nights. You're talking about some of these top teams that we think have a chance to win it. I mean, it's not, it's not rare for Boston to be up in that 45-50 range. A lot of teams over 40 on a given night. They're going to take the ones that make sense to them because you're not talking about a bunch of pure shooters like the guy you named, the guys you named. So why are their percentages so high? Because they take good shots. And a lot of it has to do with the way the foundation of their offense is built around this great player in the middle of the floor and then the simple reads that come out of it. Right. So so two things to that. Number one, did you ever – Did you ever? I probably didn't because, I don't know, maybe they didn't have this drill in the 80s and 90s. Did you ever do the, the one-on-one drill up top? Yeah. You get the ball at the top of the key yeah. and you weren't allowed yeah. to move? Yep. Okay, you did do. Okay. Yeah, we did All that. Right, so yep. I, we did that as well, I, although I didn't play a ton on one-on-one. But that was the thing. That was like a drill. You got the ball at the top of the key. And you could go one-on-one. You could use as many dribbles as you want. You just couldn't go outside of essentially the paint, right? Um, the point about uh, the threes and Shea, and this was true last year even, where they, I think they really started to build this identity around driving the basketball, is that as you get into shifts, which is essentially you're committed to help. It, it's not necessarily two on the ball, but mm-hmm. you're committed to help. Right. They move the ball and drive. And then when you shift again, they move the ball and drive. And you shift again, they move the ball and drive. And so part of the reason I think that this is, again, from watching them and also just common sense, part of the reason that I think they have such a high percentage from three is because of Chet. So now you've got a five man who can shoot, who can attack closeouts, his versatility just in that regard, attacking closeouts and shooting the three at a respectable clip. The defense has to react to that. It creates an extra layer of space. So the difference between a contested defender on a three from three feet, now all of a sudden it's five feet. It's a different game because of Chet. Uh, no, I completely agree with that. And the thing I love about Chet, he falls in line with, takes great shots. And that's the thing about Oklahoma City when I watch them play, and this is maybe, you know, there's other teams I could say it about for stretches, but th- I think consistently with OKC, nothing ever feels forced. 
ever, even the stuff that Shea gets. And you're talking about a dude that's averaging over 30 points a game that's going to be a high-volume, high-usage guy that's obviously has to come down and generate that kind of offense every night. Do you ever watch Shea Gilgis Alexander and, and kind of go, man, Shea's really getting them up tonight. Like, wow, that was a tough one. They don't really do that. They don't take those early quick threes that a lot of teams take where it feels like a guy just made up his mind to get one up. They don't really do that. And Chet's a big part of that, man. Like, he's so efficient in what, the, what he does. And his ability to extend now out to 24, 25 feet, it's a huge, it's a huge um, development for their team in the spacing that they need to have. Look, here's the thing with Oklahoma City, and I probably have not given them enough legitimate weight all year because I'm always thinking about, can you actually picture them seeing them win it? Like, win it. Get by Denver. That's what I'm talking about. Both teams healthy. Can you see them actually getting by Denver? And that's where I always kind of run into a like, no, I really can't see that. And maybe I go to a couple other teams that it would be more likely for me if they were clicking and playing right and playing well and found a rhythm and an identity and a consistency going into that series. You look at a team like the Clippers and say, if they're playing well, when they would get to a team like Denver, like I feel like they would have a better chance. But maybe, maybe I'm dead wrong about that. Um, and maybe some of it is just because of the collective inexperience of winning as a group when the stakes are raised. Gordon Hayward, by the way, uh, there's another one, uh, 55.6 yeah. from three. Uh, I want to make two points, but I'm going to make them separately because I want you to, to to sort of respond to the first one. So going back to identity, uh, Mark Dagnall gets asked all the time about their rebounding woes. and he had a great response the other day, and I'm I'm sort of paraphrasing here, here. He's like, we know it's a weakness, but we're going to manage that weakness. Joe Missoula always talks about managing the game, managing shots, right? So Joe is really into the, just the math of yeah. playing basketball, yeah, right? Yeah. So his decision-making about, do I double-team this guy? What am I willing to live with defensively? It's based on time and score. And it's based on how the game flow is going. So if his team, and they do a great job of managing turnovers, if his team is manage, managing turnovers, they're getting up the right type of threes, they're getting to the free throw line, and they're winning by seven, well, why would I, why would I double? Because we're, we're, we're managing the shots, we're managing the game. And if you look at OKC, right, they're 28th in defensive rebounding, 28th in offensive rebounding, 28th in rebound percentage overall. So they're not a good rebounding team relative to the rest of the NBA. Well, how do they manage the game? All right? They don't turn the ball over. Right. Number three in turnover percentage. They lead the league in points off of turnovers. So they're turning teams over. They are number three in opponent fast break points. So they're getting back on defense. We're willing to give up extra possessions on the offensive glass, and we're, we want to set our defense. We're not going to allow fast break points. So you combine... The, 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 the free throws on the drives, you combine the percentage of makes on drives, you combine the three-point shooting, the good shots, along with we're going to turn people over, we're going to score in transition off of turnovers, and we're not going to allow that on the other end. That mitigates, just mathematically, it mitigates some of the rebounding woes. No, completely. Well, listen, you're going to have to counter, and every team's in that same category, you're going to have to counter whatever your weakness is you have to counter it with something. You have, you have to find a way to make up for that and offset that. And one way it certainly helps you is being able to score at such an efficient rate that you're constantly back balanced defensively to not allow the early stuff. Yeah, you might give up some second shots, and they're going to because of the way that they play, the way that their personnel is set up, like the lack of depth of bigs on that team. That's the way that they're going to be. They're going to be subject to that and vulnerable to that. But the other things that they do prepare them to be able to withstand that. Where on a given night, that's not going to be their undoing. It won't be because they do so many other things well. And I think that's a very smart approach by their coaching staff. Something they're going to probably have to address going forward. You've got to shore that up. But they do so many other things well that that's not going to be like their Achilles heel. That that's ultimately what they can't survive. Yes, correct. Now, in a potential match up with a given team, right, that creates a lot of second chance points that also doesn't turn the ball over. Like, again, you have to play this game where you're managing it in a certain way. 
it potentially could come back against a certain matchup in the playoffs, right? right? Um, I think that there's a certain group of people on NBA Twitter that love Jalen Williams and understand how good Jalen Williams is. Yeah. To the casual fan, and again, I've said this a hundred times, I have nothing against casual fans. I want to be enter- entertained too, <laughs> right? I am a casual NFL fan, okay? I don't, I don't deep dive on the NFL. It's fine. I love when somebody I'm says- I'm a hardcore NFL fan. I, but I love when somebody says to me, oh no, that such and such linebacker or that safety, like he's <laughs> fucking awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, I'm like, right. oh, okay. Right. Now it yeah, makes I'll sense why that team's so yeah, good. Yeah, right. All right, it's good. <laughs> I'm, I want to tell you something. Jalen Williams is a star Mm -hmm. and because of Chet and, and the season he's having, uh, as a, as a rookie, you know, he's the second year, but as the season he's having as a rookie and some of this Wemby Chet buzz and because of Shea and truthfully, because of some of this off the store, off the court stuff with Giddy, because they are Oklahoma, Oklahoma city and they don't get a ton of nationally televised games to me. And I, I, I'm not going to say he's the most underrated or underappreciated. But to me, he just he's the best player that flies under the radar. Yeah. This guy, this guy does a little bit of everything really fucking well. You want to have a fun exercise? Go up and down the top 10, 12 teams in the NBA and start listing, like, I guess what you would label them as a co-star. I think that's a good description of who Jalen Williams is. They clearly have yeah. their top star, right? And, and any team in the league, I could say any team in the league, who's their best player? A name is going to immediately jump out of your mouth. I was thinking about this. Out of the 30 teams, there's only a couple where you might have to go, hmm, let me think about that. You're going to say a name immediately, and we're going to say the same name, right? And most people to do this for a living are going to say the same name. So you're talking about that next guy. And so he's a co-star, because I agree with you. First of all, he is a star, because how what he has done to develop his game offensively, that you can run your offense through him now when Shea's on the bench, put the ball in his hands, and the way that he can now run ball screen and make great decisions and get what he wants, and then he is affecting people on the other end of the floor. It's he's not just out there as like a conscientious defender. Like, oh yeah, you know, he plays hard defensively. No, no. He actually influences outcomes against really good players. So he is doing it on both ends. He's gotten just better and better and better at the polish in his game offensively to where he now he is a legitimate star player. And the, I was just looking at his his splits are incredible. The dude is shooting. 58% at home for the season, 50% from the three-point line for the season. Now, why does that matter? Well, they might end up with the number one seed. So he's going to get a lot of home games potentially, right? And he's re- and look, by the way, his splits on the road aren't bad, but he's really good when they play at home. Like ridiculous shooting numbers when you look at the totality of his game. So I completely agree with you. He is somebody that I think, and I don't even, I don't even know if I'd say the casual NBA fan. I think there are guys that like watch the league every night that I would consider like, man, they really love the NBA. Like they really follow it. They know it that aren't watching a lot of Oklahoma city games to really understand how far this guy has come and like what the pecking order is. But if I were to ask you start listing these co-stars and these other teams, you're, you'd be shocked when you start writing down names and say, man, no, would I take Jalen Williams over that guy? Whereas like you, like you would think your knee jerk reaction would be no, because it's going to be a bigger name. It's going to be somebody that's got more accomplishments under their belt, right? All-star appearances or like whatever. And your knee-jerk reaction is going to be, no, no, it's got to be that guy. But when you really break down the nuts and bolts of how they're playing right now, I think you take Jaden Williams over more guys than you think that are in that second seat. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And he's had some big clutch moments. You know, you talk about the ability to just run offense through him. Like how important is that going to be in a playoff run? that you have a second guy who legitimately you can run efficient offense through, who can make threes, who can get to the basket, who can make shots from the mid-range, who can make the right reads out of pick and rolls, and also very comfortable playing off of Shea. Yeah. Like there's right. no uh, there's, point. there's no butting heads there, right, right? Right. It's not my turn, your turn. It's like he's he can oscillate between roles very easily. And it's interesting. I, I, I hadn't really thought of this. Um but there, I think there's a little bit of a similarity, um, depending on lineups with them, where you could sort of make an argument, um, who like who are you going to hunt? It, it, similar to Boston, because you had like you talk about Jalen Williams defensively, 
they they have Lou Dort. Yeah, right. Who's like yeah. an all all defensive caliber wing defender, right? Shea, who blocks steals for a guard, like he's up there, right? You have Chet, Chet as a rim protector, Casein Wallace yeah. as as a as a guard who's going to fight over screens and get deflections. Kenrich Williams, who's a fucking dog, right? They they have like this ability to put out Ross, uh, put out lineups where it's like, wh- what's the, what's the matchup right. we're going to hunt? Because even even Giddy is really good positionally as a yeah. team defender. Like he's not a guy you'd want on an island with an elite level. I did see a clip of him as a low man the other day, super late on a baseline drive. But it happens to everybody. Yeah, you can find those clips on every single guy in the league. Have you seen, by the way, have you seen this Instagram or TikTok? I don't even know what it is. I I came across it on Twitter. The the we done with the 90s thing. Uh -uh. Have you seen Uh -uh. that? Uh -uh. Oh my God. It's hilarious. It's first of all, it's objectively, it's hilarious. But it's the same thing. This is guy, he's like, Basically, picking and choosing these random clips of you know '90s playoff. What did I watch the like other what? day? Like what? You talking about like the like know, Jordan the, the had bar, no the Jordan, bar brawls. The Jordan, Jordan brawl? had no left hand, so it's a clip oh, of Jordan okay. going left you. where okay. he doesn't finish, or it's like Scotty Pippen shooting an air ball. Right, right, right. And it, it's 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 you know very much picking Cherry and choosing. Cherry the worst <laughs> moments of each guy yeah. as a player. Right. Yeah. Okay. I airballed a layup once, by the way, my rookie year. I'm sure I did. I don't. Even, it's been too long now, so I don't. I, I'm sure I did. I remember vividly shooting the worst airball of my life against the Miami Heat from the left wing. For some reason, I remember that shot just drifting right on me. It was off by like two feet right, and I didn't shoot many airballs, but I remember that one. Every now and then, I'll have like PTSD. day. It'll it'll pop up in my head. <sighs> Anyways, I think the Thunder are going to be super fun. This is going to be fun. This is going to be fun to watch. Oh yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. It's be fun to break down. It's going to be fun to watch Mark Dagnalt make adjustments within, the, within a series. Um, and I, I think they have enough optionality with their rotation that they can make lineup adjustments depending on who their series matchup is. 